This case began in Paris. In a small apartment house where a man named Jean Brielle was tormented by his thoughts about the past. In World War II, he had spent 14 months in a Nazi prison camp. And according to the story, he had been beaten mercilessly and tortured until he had made a confession. A confession which cost 11 other prisoners their lives. Among the law enforcement duties of this department are several not usually associated with the Treasury by the general public. One of these duties involves the Neutrality Act passed by the United States Congress. This statute provides that no American citizen can export arms or strategic materials to foreign countries unless a license has been obtained from the Department of State. And now in my role as Chief of the Division of Investigations, United States Customs, which is charged with the enforcement of that statute, I'd like to tell you the story of a man who violated it. A man who would sell anything for a price, including his own country. This is Treasury File 4286, United States Customs. The case of the Iron Curtain. You should have let me die. If you died, would I want to live? There's no hope for me, Marie. Whatever I do, wherever I go, there is always someone who remembers. Did you see someone today? Someone from the war? Murderer, he called me. Murderer. The war is over. Why don't they leave you alone? Ten years the war is over. But only the guns are still. The men still go on. And there were so many men in that prison camp to remember what I did, man. I can never get away from them. Murderer, he called me. Murderer, murderer! Jean, it's not true. You're not a murderer, Jean. How can I know who I am? Oh, what I did. Oh, Marie, that prison camp was like a nightmare. Oh, Jean. Mon cher, you must forget. Forget. Forget that 11 men died because of what I did? 11 men, Marie. Riddled with bullets because they tried to escape and they never had a chance. Because I told the Nazis their plan. I informed on them. Oh, but I won't believe it. It wasn't you. It was someone else who informed. Who? I was the only one they questioned. And for three days they had me in that room, torturing me, hammering at me till I was out of my mind. I had to tell them. I'll never believe that you did, John. I'll never, never... Hello? Yes, this is Jean Briel's residence. Just a moment, please. There's a man who wants to talk to you, an American who's here in Paris. Who is it? Oh, Mr. Tyler, Sidney Tyler. Tyler? Tyler, in a prison camp, there's a soldier of this name, Tyler, with American. But he says he's a friend of yours. No, in a prison camp, I had no friends. You tell him I'm not here. Oh, but I... No, go on, tell him. Hello, monsieur, I am sorry. Jean Briel is not here just now. Tell him I am very anxious to get a hold of him. It's about a business opportunity that I think will do him a great deal of good. Yes, I'll be here in my hotel room. If he doesn't call me back tonight, you tell him that I'll get in touch with him tomorrow. So, Jean, all you have to do is represent me here in Paris. 
Take new orders, store shipments. Once in a while, run up a little new business. See, Jean, I'm expanding. I need someone to handle my affairs here while I'm tied up with company matters in New York. Oh, no, I appreciate the opportunity you are giving to me, but... But what? The camp. The prison camp. You were there when those men who tried to escape were killed. You must have heard the story about me. Jean, a prison camp can do a lot of things to a man. Can make him forget the basic rules of decency. The Nazis were good at that. You know then what I did. Could you help it if the Nazis tortured you until you broke down? Besides, that was ten years ago. You told me it was yesterday. Ten years, Jean. That's a long time. Time enough for people to forget. I want you to work for me, Jean. I want you to be my friend. You seem optimistic about your chances, Mr. Tyler. It'll work all right. Miss Brielle is just the man I've been looking for. Weak, worried, naive. You'll never even suspect what this business is all about. Furthermore, he has a, an established firm here. Doesn't make much money, but it does have a reputation. Unfortunately, Mr. Tyler, the government I represent is not interested in Mr. Brielle's reputation. We are interested in only one thing, airplane parts. That takes time, Mr. Novak. You know what the law is. America is still a free country. I can buy all the aircraft parts I want, but of course I can't sell them to a country behind the Iron Curtain. First, I have to get them into France to a reputable dealer. And this man, Brielle, will be your dealer? If I hire him to be my Paris representative, he will be. I can get a license to ship aircraft parts to a friendly country. Once they're here, then it's up to you. But if this Brielle talks... How can he talk? To him, this will be a strictly legitimate deal. And if anything goes wrong, we can always put the blame on him. Have a cigar, Mr. Oh, think of it, Marie. He's a representative in Paris. Do you know do you realize what this will mean to us? Already he has orders. Thousands of dollars of orders. Oh, Sean, I'm so happy for you. Oh, well, it's not just the money, you know. It's him. He trusts me. He calls me his friend. You know he was in that prison camp and he calls me his friend. Oh, he must be a wonderful man. Well, I'm a new person, ma chère. One day with him and I'm a different person. Oh, no, this, this deal we have made will bring me a new life. I will live with pride again. To all appearances, the deal which Jean Brielle had made with Tyler was an excellent one. But what Jean Brielle did not know was the fact that Tyler had tried to make the very same deal in London only one week before. With a British purchasing agent who turned Tyler down. And the information was subsequently passed on to the American Embassy and through the Office of Munitions Control of the United States Department of State, a report was forwarded to the Division of Investigations of Customs. Well, you'll have time to go over all of this in detail later on, Fremont but I can give you the general picture in a very few moments. It concerns a man named Sidney Tyler, an exporter from New York, who may be involved in a possible violation of the Neutrality Act. Munitions? Airplane parts. Presumably made for big commercial ships, but interchangeable with similar parts for combat planes. I see. This Tyler applied for an export license to ship $90,000 worth of these airplane parts to Paris for resale in France. But it now appears that there's an unusual circumstance about the whole deal. We have a report from munitions control that only one week before Tyler applied for his license, he made a similar proposal for the same type of equipment to a purchasing agent in London. The man mentioned in this report. Yes. And in the meantime, Tyler's shipment of these airplane parts has already reached Paris. So I want you to find out exactly how those parts are to be resold in France and who is buying them. Yes, sir. I'll check with Tyler's New York office right away. I don't understand why you wanted to question me, Mr. Fremont. All the information you want is right here on my application for an export license. Well, I was just checking, Mr. Tyler. After all, it's our job to make sure that airplane parts don't eventually find their way into countries behind the Iron Curtain. Oh, I understand that, Mr. Fremont. And so does my representative in Paris. You've done business with this man before, this Mr. Brielle? No, never actually done business with him, but uh, I've known him for over 10 years. Has he actually resold any of these airplane parts that you sent in your shipment? 
Yes, as a matter of fact, he has. Well, would you mind giving me the names of some of the companies that have been purchasing these parts? Well, I'm afraid you'll have to wait till Mr. Briel sends that information to me, Mr. Fremont. I don't have it just now. But don't you remember the names of any of the companies? Don't you have records of the orders? No, not yet. I tell you what I'll do, Mr. Fremont. I'll send you copies of them as soon as I receive them from Briel. All right, Mr. Tyler. I'll be expecting to hear from you. Goodbye. Only a few moments after Agent Fremont left Tyler's office, Tyler made arrangements for an immediate flight to France. And the next morning at 10 a.m., he arrived at the Orly Airdrome in Paris. Within an hour, he was at the office of Jean Briel. Oh, nothing's wrong, Jean. I just flew in to see how things were going, see how those orders for plane parts were coming along. You said on the telephone Tuesday that the Touraine Aircraft Company wanted to take the whole order. Their sales order come through yet? Oui, monsieur. I signed the sales contract on Tuesday, and uh, they collected the entire shipment yesterday. This is the sales contract? Oui, monsieur. They paid by certified check, and I deposited it to the company's account this morning. Well, I'm glad our little business arrangement is working out so well. <laughs> it's been wonderful, monsieur Tyler. You know, I have an entirely new outlook on my life. Uh, a new pride in my work. Good, good. Well, you know, my wife says I've not been like this for years, and it's all because of you. Well, I'll always do anything I can to help you, Jean. Oh, by the way, Jean, do you happen to have a copy of your old letterhead? I'd like to take it down to the printers and have some new stationery made up. Oh, why, certainly, monsieur. I probably won't be in again today, but I'll certainly drop by before I leave for New York. Meanwhile, I want to thank you, Jean, for the excellent job you've been doing. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Monsieur Tyler. You're the best friend I ever had. Convinced that Sidney Tyler had been withholding information from the Treasury Department regarding the shipment of airplane parts to Paris, Agent Fremont was sent to Paris, where he could investigate the eventual disposition of the parts and the representative who handled them, Jean Briel. I, I, I checked that the shipment of airplane parts myself, Monsieur Fremont. I know that all the customs regulations were complied with. Oh, well, we're not questioning that, Monsieur Briel. We're interested in what happened to the airplane parts after they reached you. But I just told you they were sold. To the Terrain Aircraft Company, is that right? Oh, oui. May I have their address, please? We'd like to know exactly who's going to use them and for what purpose. Now, I have a list here of all the aircraft factories in France, but the Touraine Company doesn't happen to be among them. Perhaps your records of the sale would be of help to me. Would you mind letting me see them? Why, no, no, of course not. I would be glad to cooperate with you in any way, monsieur, but I can't think why the Touraine Company would not be listed in the... That's strange. What's the matter? The records, they're not in the files. No record of the order or the sales contract? I can't seem to find anything. What about the delivery seats from your warehouse? Nothing. Nothing is here. Well, surely you must know where the company is. Whereas Paris representatives have their offices. Uh, one moment, monsieur. Oh, I know I have the card of the purchasing agent somewhere. Oh, monsieur, I hope you don't think that I would deliberately... Ah. Well, uh... There is a card. You see, their offices are 39 Rue d'Aville. Thank you. Now, I'm sure they will have copies of the records which you require, but just to make sure that they will give you the information, I will come with you, huh? All right, Mr. Briel. Suppose we go along right now. Oui, monsieur. Accompanied by Jean Briel, Agent Fremont left immediately for the address printed on the business card, which had been left by a representative of the Touraine Aircraft Company. But upon their arrival at the firm's office, the two men found that the Terrain Aircraft Company no longer occupied space there. As for its new address, there was no information available. Upon proceeding to the trucking concern, which Jean Briel claimed had picked up the shipment for delivery to the Terrain Company, Agent Fremont received information which threw suspicion on Briel himself. For the dispatcher at the trucking concern, 
claimed that his firm had never picked up or delivered such a shipment. The mystery surrounding the Terrain Aircraft Company was further heightened as the result of a visit to the bank on which the check for the shipment had been drawn. The Terrain Company did have an account here, but they drew only one check on it, the one to Brielle's firm, and then closed the account. This is not as it seems, Monsieur Fremont. I knew nothing of the Turin Company. I simply acted in good faith. Like selling them $90,000 worth of airplane parts without knowing anything about them? Didn't it occur to you that they might be a front for some country behind the Iron Curtain? No, I would not sell to an enemy country. I would not sell out my own country. You think I'm a traitor? I don't think anything, Monsieur Briel. I just want to know what happened to those parts. But I have done nothing wrong. I had nothing whatever to do with it. I relied on Brielle completely for the contacts, the negotiations, and the eventual delivery. And you think it was working directly with a foreign agent to obtain these airplane parts for some country behind the Iron Curtain? Well, I wouldn't want to accuse him of anything like that. But uh, now that I think of it, he could have planned this whole thing from the very beginning. How do you mean? Well, perhaps I shouldn't say it, because I like Brielle. And I'd hate to see him get in any kind of a jam. But, on the other hand, if, if he's selling out to the Reds, perhaps there's one thing that you ought to know about him. According to the story I heard during the war, he squealed on his fellow prisoners in a German prison camp, told the guards that they were planning to escape. And what happened? Eleven men were killed. All right, Mr. Tyler. I won't take up any more of your time. Not at all. Mr. I appreciate your cooperation. Yes. Calling from Paris. Yes, put him on, please. Hello, Fremont. Well, how's it going? I see. And the Terrain Company was just a dummy setup to get hold of those airplane parts. Yes, sir. I've requested assistance from the French police. And they've already started an investigation of Brielle. But oddly enough, my feeling is he may be telling the truth. Yes, sir, I know everything seems to be stacked against him. But I think that's why he's being used as a dupe. By Tyler or a foreign agent. All right, keep working with the French police, Fremont. And if Tyler seems to you to be the one who's behind all this, put him under surveillance. It's just possible he may contact the man he's really working with. you a dozen times never to come to this warehouse. If you want to contact me, leave a message at my hotel. There wasn't time. I had to tell you what's been happening. There's a treasury man here in Paris investigating the whole case. If he ever finds out that this phony toy company is a blind for your app... Be quiet, will you? Tyler, it takes time to repack all these airplane parts. They have to recreate them and do it right so they'll pass the customs inspection at border. You've had them for two days. And who have I had to do the work? These men are not laborers. I have to use people I can trust. Now get out of here and leave us alone. Besides, you have nothing more to do with this deal. You have been paid, and we have received the shipment. The rest is up to me. Except for one thing. I have to make sure that I'm not caught. If you are caught or not, this is your affair, not mine. Now go on. The surveillance of Sidney Tyler led Agent Fremont to the first important clue in the solution of this difficult and complex case. The fact that he had visited the warehouse of a company known as the International Toy Company was immediately reported to the French police, which had long suspected this organization of being a front for a group of international operatives. Although there was not sufficient evidence to obtain a search warrant at this time, both the warehouse and the company offices were placed under surveillance. It's like a nightmare, Larry. The whole thing is like a nightmare. This American agent thinks I've been selling these airplane parts to the communists. He thinks I'm a traitor. But there was such a company, Jean. There was a Touraine aircraft company. No, it existed for only one purpose, to obtain those parts. It was all a plot just to get those parts. 
And they will believe that I was in on it, that I deliberately sold to a fake firm. Jean, you did nothing wrong. They cannot blame you for it. Blame? Blame? No, I... It will be like that prison camp again. They will say I'm a traitor. A man not fit to live. Jean, I'll die when I hear you talk like this. Don't say another word. Well, what will I do, Marie? They won't believe the truth. The order for those parts came directly to me. Even Monsieur Tyler doesn't know of the Turin Company. But Monsieur Tyler knows you, Jean. He will help you. He's the only one who can help. No, you've got to help me, Monsieur Tyler. You've got to tell him it wasn't my fault. Wasn't it? You know, I've had you all wrong, Brielle. When I appointed you my Paris representative, I made a big mistake. But it wasn't my fault. You told me Turin Aircraft was a reliable concern. You told me yourself on the telephone when I called you in New York. Otherwise, I would never have drawn up the contract. Do you expect anybody to believe that? But it's the truth. And you know it. Now, all I'm asking you to do is to tell the police exactly what you have told me. Don't be a fool. But what is the harm of helping an innocent man? No, Monsieur Tyler, you're my friend. You believed in me, you gave me a chance. Now you won't even tell him the truth. Why? Because you're no good, Brielle. First you squealed to the Nazis, and now you've sold out to the Reds. And I did not sell out. That night in the German prison camp, when the guards were beating you up to make you talk, do you know what happened? You stood there like a dumb animal. Whimpering and crying until they had to give you a shot in the arm to bring you to your senses. No, don't. I don't want to hear anymore. That's what you said then, and that's what you kept saying. Until they brought in another prisoner and tortured him. They beat him up because you wouldn't talk, and they beat him up again until he had to talk. Who, who was this other prisoner? What was his name? Let go of me. What did he say? Nothing. He was the one who talked, wasn't he? He! He was the one who talked, wasn't he? He! Not me, this other prisoner. My throat! Help! My throat! You tell me it was him, it was this other prisoner. Yes, it was him. It was you. It had to be you. How else could you have known who it was if it wasn't you? You killed those men. And all these years I've lived in pain because of what you have done. All these years I've suffered the shame of your life, your cowardice. I'll prove it. I'll prove it to the whole world. I'll prove that I'm not guilty of this crime either. Jacques, it was him. He's the one to blame for all this. He sold the parts to the Turin Company. Mr. Tyler? This officer has a warrant for your arrest. What do you mean? Those airplane parts you sold to Mr. Novak. We picked him up when his men tried to remove the shipment from the toy company warehouse. He said that you arranged the sale. I never heard of Novak. No? Well, we'll see about that later. In the meantime, you better come along with us. You better come along, too, Mr. Brielle. We'll need you for questioning. Oh, yes, Monsieur, of course. Oh, Marie. What I have to tell you. What I have to tell you. When Sidney Tyler was brought to trial in the United States for violation of the Neutrality Act, he continued to blame Jean Brielle for the crime and proclaim his own innocence. However, after hearing the evidence, a jury found him guilty as charged, and he was sentenced to a term of three years in the federal penitentiary. As for Jean Brielle, who came to this country as a witness for the government and testified at Tyler's trial, he is at last a free man